Hello, you're very welcome to another Audiovisual Cultures. This is the podcast where we hoke and poke in the nooks and crannies of media, arts and all things cultural production. I'm your host Paula Blair and I am really delighted to present this conversation today with Damien Taylor who does lots of stuff. There's loads to get through in this episode but mainly Damien has been using his vast experience in the technology industries to find creative solutions through storytelling to redress gaps in representation in media and tech industries. And you'll hear all about this in the episode. We're going to talk about Damien's podcasting, particularly his series Tech Witch, of which he is the creator and co-writer. And we're going to talk about loads of his different experiences. And it's a really lovely conversation. I know you'll get a lot out of listening to us. So before I pass over to my past self and Damien, a massive thank you to our amazing patrons over at patreon.com forward slash AV cultures for supporting the podcast. It really means a lot that you keep supporting the show and me making it. If anyone else listening is interested in getting some extra content and some early releases, uh, we've got a special behind the scenes tier and there's spy PAT tier, which would just help maintain the podcast and help keep improving everything and give me something for the work that I do making the show because I don't have ads on the show and I'm determined to keep it that way. However, I am very happy to do in-kind ads with other podcasts. So if anyone's listening and you're interested in that sort of thing, hit me up. I've got a little 30 second ad that'll just slip right into one of your shows and I'm very happy to do the same. On a more fun note, I don't do it very often because it's a bit scary, but I occasionally look at the ACAST analytics for the show and I think I, I've started to enjoy concentrating more on what countries were being downloaded in and Belgium keeps coming back on top. I, I don't know what it is, but hello Belgium, bonjour, you're so welcome. I love that people that are listening to the show or at least downloading it, whether you're listening or not, who knows, but you're consistently coming out uh, above the UK and the US so well done you. (laughs) I'm just so delighted to have you on board. Please do get in touch. I'd love to hear where people are listening from uh, and to learn about why you're listening. Um, That would be amazing. I'm going to stop blathering at you because I just enjoyed so much chatting with Damien. I really enjoy listening to his podcast. He makes another podcast called Professional Confessions that I really recommend. As we talk about, it's come up in the podcast before that we've dealt with Dr. Troy Hall and Rachel Brick. We've talked about toxic workplaces and abuse in workplaces and that sort of thing before. So Professional Confessions is actually a really, really helpful podcast to listen to and there's only a few episodes so far it's really quite new so please do make sure you go and look in the show notes below where there are links for all of these things for now enjoy this time with Damien he's brilliant Damien Taylor, you're so welcome to Audiovisual Cultures. I've been really excited to talk to you since your agents got in touch last week. Um, You're exactly who I want to talk to on this podcast. (laughs) So you're so welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. I'm so flattered. I was really excited (laughs) to be on the podcast. So if it's okay, can I start by asking you, how are you? Are you doing okay? And whereabouts (laughs) are you? (laughs) <laughs> of course, of course. I'm doing great. I'm enjoying this unseasonably warm fall mm-hmm. weather that we're having. And I'm, I'm in Los Angeles, so mm-hmm. we've had a very odd fall. It's been, you know, it's 40 degrees today, 80 degrees tomorrow, and then rainy, and then the sun is out and you're melting. So uh, mm-hmm. it's been bizarre, but I'm, I'm enjoying the, the fluctuations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we're in this full throes of autumn where I am in Newcastle upon Tyne. It's very cold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and very dark. So, yes. <laughs> um, so I'm enjoying the brightness of your screen while mine is based <laughs> in darkness. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Damien, I have been really enjoying listening through your different podcasts and reading up on all your work that you're doing across different media. You have a real emphasis on addressing lack of diversity across different media. I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of those issues. We can outline a lot of that for people in a bit. So I'm really keen to hear about your your fiction scripted podcasting as well as your non-fiction podcasting. I've been listening a lot to Professional Confessions and I am there with you, with all of you. (laughs) I I got (laughs) stories. So I'm really, really getting a lot out of that. But firstly, would you be happy to describe yourself and give us an overview of who Damien Taylor is, what you're all about, and the kinds of things that you're working on? Sure. It's funny. So I'm probably the most bizarre creative you'll ever meet. (laughs) So I I started off doing medicine and science. That's where my career began. And so coming into, I've always played in both creative and very scientific spaces. And most people don't do that. And I I get bored if I don't have both of those elements going on in my life at some point. And so I've always approached everything from that perspective. When I've worked for major studios and when I work at studios, I'm usually the data guy who's building the strategy for which films do we do? What audiences do we want? to go to what channels do we want to to use but by that same token i was moonlighting as a photographer and an editor for a magazine um, concurrently while working in studios and so i've always played in both of those camps and i it's taken a while but i've been able to bring both of those things to bear into my creativity now I, i can use data to help inform my creative and that's really it's not that i it's not paint by numbers sort of creative it's I have an idea but I never really fully know if it's something that's interesting to anyone else or is it just something that I fancy and so I I usually use data and test it out and see does anybody else like this Mm -hmm. (laughs) am I by myself and (laughs) depending on the the response then I'll prioritize which projects I work on first and it's yeah so I am I I like to say a geek with a creative soul (laughs) I love that (laughs) nerds are very very welcome on this podcast. (laughs) Mm, That's a good place to be. (laughs) Yeah, because I think on your website, isn't it, you say scientific message for content. Is that the kind of thing we're getting into? Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely it. And the the approach I take for a lot of the creative is finding out why do people like it? That's the thing that really makes Mm. me happy. And that's why I really, even in my career, I've always, it's always been around sort of taking things apart and figuring out what makes it work. And so getting to the crux of what does someone enjoy about this movie, this TV show, this short video, this photography, whatever it is, and then deconstructing that and sometimes taking out everything that's superfluous and just distilling it down to that one thing. A lot of times it ends up making my life so much simpler because Mm -hmm. I I realize I had a lot of extra layers I don't need to be there. (laughs) (laughs) And it feels very bound up in technology as well and how much a part of our lives now technology is and I think we're talking very modern technology of computers the digital and etc definitely definitely I mean it's when I think about what a lot of people have told me throughout my career especially other creatives it's I always go to my gut I don't like to use data that'll he's away my creativity and I actually disagree with that very strongly mm-hmm. because our gut is data it's a small data set it's a, a combination of all of our experiences and the things that we've learned and the impacts or that they have or haven't had and we take that and then we formulate that well then this should work based on all of those experiences and so what I like to do is take my gut and see well I have this small data set which is my experience how universal is that experience or is there a bigger audience for this. And so I, I just look at it as a way of supplementing that instinct that we have, which is in essence a collection of data points we've collected throughout life. Mm. How are you, in what ways are you channeling that then into your more creative outputs now? Because I'm probably thinking mostly your podcast Tech Witch, which is in its second season. And I mm-hmm. saw today that there is work underway on an animated pilot for that. That's so exciting. Yes, very excited. <laughs> yeah, I've never been in the world of animation. I've always wanted to, but now finally get to, to animate something. So this is super exciting. Tech, which is probably the perfect example of the unique process that I, I, I like to use for creativity. It's, it was an idea that I had. So going back to my, my nerddom, <laughs> I love fantasy and I love sci-fi. And I one day I was, what was I watching? 
I don't remember. I, I was watching something. It may have been a Doctor Who episode or something. Mm-hmm. And in my head, wanted to figure out, I wonder if there's a way to make something that's both sci-fi and fantasy. Mm-hmm. That would be the perfect series for me. And just through that thought process in my head, I came up with witches who control technology. That would be awesome, right? And <laughs> thus the idea was born. But I didn't know if I was the only person who thought that or if it was, you know, something more universal. So that one, I actually, I remember I, I talked to a couple of friends. We were working on a production together. and. I I dropped the idea just kind of casually. Hey, you know what? I was just thinking, wouldn't that be kind of cool? And they're like, yeah, that'd be really cool. I don't know why no one's ever thought of that. I go, oh, okay. Well, listen. Um, and then I asked a couple more people and they, they kind of said the same thing. And I figured, well, I should probably do some more testing because this is also my circle of friends and we all seem to think similarly. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually did a, I went to our, we have two Facebook pages and we have one that's all about our content called Digital Compendium. And so mm. I went to the Digital Compendium page and I put up an ad. I, I had some and help design a poster for it. And I did like the whole log line and everything and did a campaign as if it was coming out tomorrow. It was coming soon. Check out Tech Witch and to see if anyone would be interested. And literally overnight, our page went from 900 followers to 11,000 followers. Mm. Not one ad. And then people, I love this. This would be great. And I figured, well, maybe there's something there on that <laughs> one. So we decided to do Tech Witch. And it was initially, we, I, I wanted to do it animated from the start. Mm. And we had a, a brand, a music label partner who was going to work with us. And for me, music is really, really important through everything. I mean, it's, it's a big part of my creative process. Even in doing photography, I usually start with music and the sound to convey the mood and then how do I bring that to life visually mm-hmm. so I, I figured a music label was a perfect partner for doing this and then COVID hit and they laid off 80 percent of their oh. team and had no more money and my business partner and I and the writing team were just trying to figure out well what do we do if no one's mm-hmm. paying for this podcast we don't need much money to do it <laughs> and we can revamp the scripts. And so that's what we did um, and started building it out from that way. And then we realized it was a perfect way to hone the story and test it out and build an audience before we did anything animated anyway. Mm-hmm. And that was so such a frequent process, I think, with radio. So many shows that we think of as television shows, they started off as radio serials. So yeah, yeah that really works. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, if it's not broke, why fix it? We figured go with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And And it is very visual when you're listening to it, I find. I was listening Mm to some episodes this morning and I think between both the speech and the music you're seeing a world you know a world is kind of coming alive in your mind you know so I think it is really effective you you're really picturing the characters I think because sorry I've forgotten the name of your narrator who's who's reading the stories oh Caitlin Caitlin that's it and she's great at performing the dialogue of the characters you know because you so you start to actually flesh out these different people who are um, Mm -hmm. having conversations and things you know so it it does feel very vivid you know and the artwork for it is very vivid so you can start to imagine it maybe as an animation (laughs) so that's really cool and Caitlin's amazing Mm -hmm. I remember we were looking for voiceover talent and I was thinking I'm gonna have to get all these actors and we're gonna have to do this big production um, and my writing partner Trey said well why don't we just have a narrator and read it like an audio drama and I was on board with that because for me it meant it was cheaper to make (laughs) and so I was really excited and I started looking and I couldn't find anyone and Caitlin happened to be one of my grade school friends her husband's cousin and she's all oh well my 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 husband's cousin is staying with us for a couple of weeks and she does voiceover do you want to talk to her and in my head I was thinking sure okay I'll talk <laughs> to your friend your husband's cousin <laughs> and I spoke to her and she said just send me the first two pages of the script and I'll just read them and do a recording for you for free that way you can get a sense for my voice oh. and it'll be like my audition so I did and she read it and she brought all the characters to life mm-hmm. they, they sounded like different people even though it was just her yeah. voice and in that moment, I said, forget it. I'm not talking to anyone else. No more auditions. You have it. This is great. And she's been amazing. She's been such an amazing part of the team. We even bring her in on the writing process just to, how would we bring this to life? What do you think about this? And wow. she has such amazing insights. And I really like that we can now collaborate as a team wholly mm. together versus sort of segmenting and passing things off. Oh, that sounds wonderful. This is such a great process. I mean, <laughs> it's one of those things where sometimes nepotism can work out. <laughs> Exactly. which it feels really wrong but you know <laughs> if somebody no, she just was so perfect exactly. yeah she was so good and she's a singer too so at some point I'd love to incorporate ah. music from her in the into the series but she's just so professional and such a she 
brought recommendations and tweaks that I never even mm-hmm. thought of to bring in. Um, and she even makes suggestions. And really early on, she was so incredibly respectful. She said, well, I know that these are your words and it's really important. And so I don't want to overstep my bounds, but if it's okay with you, can I make a suggestion? And she was there and I could have said no, and she would have been completely fine with mm-hmm. it. But I, I, of course, was like, no, no, let me know. And she's been amazing, just helping us stay grounded mm-hmm. and even rising to the challenge where I threw in a couple extra characters. I, I think one time I gave her like five characters mm-hmm. in the same scene and she's all, I hate you for doing that to me, but I really enjoyed it because now I have these characters and they all had to sound different in this scene because I'm the only person reading. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I suppose that it'd be helpful then if we could actually tell people what we're talking about when we're talking about tech questions <laughs> <laughs> what the story is. <laughs> Um, so oh, this is true. <laughs> so Tech Witch is a story about two twins, Lowell and Brigitte Matthew, who discover that their family, it's been thought that their family just doesn't have magic, that they're kind of magical duds. And then they discover that that's not the case, mm-hmm. that they're actually the fulfillment of a prophecy that's unlocked on their 21st birthday, where they discover that they can control nature like other witches, but they can also control and manipulate technology. And so it's interesting to see their journey going from accepting the fact that they were quote unquote magical duds to accepting the fact that now that they are you know, these super powerful, which is that kind of outshine everyone and how they, they deal with that struggle. But it's also interesting in that what we'll see later is, and this is way later in the, in the series, that there's this interesting conversation of is technology so different from nature and is nature different from technology? Mm-hmm. Can the two merge and become something that's different? So like biotechnology, mm-hmm. for example. And we'll start to look at that. And I think it's just get really fun mm-hmm. at that point. And I suppose then you, there's a little touch of family drama in there. <laughs> <laughs> sister. Lots of family drama, <laughs> yeah. Brother and sister fighting. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and being that age as well. <laughs> Yeah, 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 all the angst that goes with it and yeah. just f- figuring life out. And then at the same time, by the way, you happen to have these new powers that you didn't know you had. <laughs> I suppose that mode of storytelling, I mean, you told us about the creative process and it was quite shaped by our circumstances lately, but also are there any other aims with that method of storytelling? Is there anything else you're trying to address through the Tech Witch stories? Yeah, so I I do this, I'm trying to do this with all of the the stories and series that we, we bring out is I really want to be able to... I like diverse voices, but not in a way that's so egregious. And I I think othering and creates more division. Um, So often I feel like what happens is you'll get something and if the main character is Black, it's going to be named Black something. So you Mm. have to know. And I I mean, my opinion is we have eyes. We know that. We don't need you to tell us, right? And instead of focusing on the universal nature of our humanity, yeah, they're, they're expressed and the experiences are different, but the underlying reactions and emotions are the things that we all share I feel like a lot of times that doesn't happen and so I wanted to make sure that I could do that in in my stories so what you'll see is in tech which you don't hear anything about their race or mm-hmm. anything especially in the first season we didn't even put visuals really to them on purpose so mm-hmm. that people could imagine them how they wanted them to be but we included subtle hints that were realistic to life so you would know what this character was going through so if you were somebody who had a similar experience you would know that mm-hmm. but if you were someone who didn't you wouldn't be left out, you wouldn't feel like you couldn't understand what was happening. I think a great example is Lowell in the arcade. And he's playing, there's two, this won't give anything away for anyone who plans mm-hmm. to listen, but there are two guys at his school who have been picking on him forever. Um, and so they're, they're just basically bullying him and he has a big afro and they're throwing things in it mm. to see what gets caught. And any kid who's ever had a big curly afro mm. knows that that happens or someone tries to pet your hair, right? And it's something that's subliminal. It's not saying, hey, this is a black kid, but it's saying that this is something that happens in life but the thing that everyone can identify with is he's being picked on yeah and that's the the universal experience that we can identify with it doesn't matter what color you are or what you look like everyone has had that experience at some point and so i want to be able to draw on those experiences that we can all relate to um some more than others in the specifics of it but really capitalize on what the emotion is and so i tried to do use this to to draw that out Mm -hmm. that's a really nice example Would you like to receive updates, links and special offers straight to your inbox? Then visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com to sign up to our mailing list.
you mentioned as well working on digital compendium and there's a you have a magazine is that right yeah yeah so that's that magazine is slowly becoming the brand for the the series that we have coming out so right now there's tech witch and then there are two more stories that are going to be coming out um, next year under it Um, one of them is called incubus curse Mm. it's about a guy who goes to college and he's kind of really smart run of the mill but very average and for the most part, forgettable. And then a case of mistaken identity gets him cursed and he's turned into an incubus. Mm-hmm. And so now he has to deal with the sudden, really strong urges that you know happens in college. It's sort of the heightened college sexuality exploration. But then also the fact that now he's visible because of his, this new change in his life. He's suddenly really visible. And how does he handle that mm-hmm. scenario? What does it do to his life around him? And then the other, which I'm really excited about, is called Muses. I've been really big into Greek mythology oh, for a me while. Too. And so... oh, <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yes. There's a podcast I love called Let's Talk About Myths, Baby. Ooh. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love Liv. She's a, she's a host um, and she talks about a lot of Greek mythology and she'll do it with a feminist bent, which is also really fun to hear because, I mean, Greek mythology is really misogynistic mm. and like the gods, especially Zeus, are not good people at <laughs> all. <laughs> but it's still really fun to listen to and, and like go through. But in that, um, I was postulating around muses. What if they're, because no one knows how many muses there really were. Sometimes there are three, sometimes there are nine. And so there's not this exact number. And I took that to like its most extreme logical conclusion. What if there was an infinite mm. number of them and we didn't know and they were everywhere? And what if their ability to inspire actually allowed them to control and manipulate humanity? Ooh. And so there's a story about muses is about a woman who's a reporter who is following a senator around and discovers that the senator is actually a muse and that most, if not all, people in power were muses and they were just leveraging that to control humanity and so her mission to sort of expose it and let the world know what's going on is that one, I think that one is really fun because it, it's really grounded you don't have like these big superpowers of people their influence is I can make you do what I want by speaking to you or I sing a song and you feel inspired mm-hmm. or I can create emotions in you and so her quest to expose it actually puts her at in peril and so she finds herself running for her life and hiding now at the risk of just trying to tell humanity what's really going on wow. but i'm excited about that one that one sounds so fun mm-hmm. and so you the creator of those and you're writing is that right do you have other production roles with those so yes i'm the creator of them i'm writing i have a writing partner who's writing tech witch with me i haven't found a writing partner for muses yet i really would like to find one mm. i've had people who's been consulting but um i'm also i, I don't want to be the person who has the humor to think I can write from this woman's perspective and I can do it better (laughs) than anyone else can because it's not my experience Mm. and so I want to be able to let a real experience show through in that and somebody who can really speak to it because what I'd be looking at from the outside in Mm -hmm. I mean I want someone who can actually convey the nuances that I don't have access to so that one I'm hopeful to to find one and then Incubus Curse I'm I'm writing as well Mm -hmm. and then I do the production of the podcast yeah I love finding the music that's my favorite part okay so So for music then because with Tech Witch it is it is very electronic you know the the music and the sound design and it's one of those where what is sound design what is music you know it kind of they slip over one another quite a bit I find so what do you you know for the music what involvement do you have what are you looking for you know what's going on there for you so it, it's funny it's it's usually sometimes the music has been chosen before any word has ever been written I, I think we spoke about this a little bit earlier how just hearing something and understanding the visual and the emotion you create an image in your head and so I'll usually like there are scenes in Tech Witch, for example that haven't happened yet we, I mean they're third season out and I've picked music for them already mm-hmm. just because I I know the emotion I can feel it and I can see it in my head and then I happen to have been listening to Spotify or something and that song happened to fit really well with that visual that I had in my head and it told that story and so you know that's going in the list mm-hmm. um, but I usually really try to lean on the the more guttural emotion okay. of the music first um, and so for something called tech which it seemed weird if I went in with like all the violins <laughs> and natural music um, and it, it felt like it needed to have something that was a little bit more 
chaotic. Mm. And that fit today's world where there's something always vying for your attention, which is why we'll have, you know, sound and then the music and then sound. And That's how I felt actually when I was listening to it. And I thought, oh gosh, I think this is deliberate where I just, you know, because I find myself listening to the music and having to really concentrate to listen to the voice again. You know, it was, it's pulling you back and forth. And I thought, this is what our lives are like, you know, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, you know, Facebook and no, do your actual job, Paula. <laughs> Uh, that sort of thing that's the fun part yeah Um, and with tech which especially there are times where I want the music so if you never hear what Caitlin is saying the music is telling the same story so you end up not really missing anything and so I I wanted to make sure I have that Mm -hmm. and there are a couple of times where I usually find music without lyrics but there are a couple of times where I left the lyrics in Mm -hmm. on purpose because the lyrics tell the story as well so that it may be really quiet in the background and then it'll slowly build to overtake the voice but it's because now they're competing and the one thing that's interesting is we're, with music you can hear multiple things going on and process them at the same time if it was just a bunch of people speaking you didn't get it but if it's music it suddenly makes sense and you can comprehend all the lines and conversations that are going on so i'll do that on purpose to let the music tell the story in a way that i don't think that we can do in normal speech mm-hmm. um, we, we can't be as dramatic or as emotive in normal speech as we can in music and so i i do that on purpose and some people it's it's too much and it's overwhelming mm-hmm. and I, I realize that i think the visual series will make that easier for those people mm-hmm. but then for the people who um are interested and want to it i think it'll it's a, it's a fun challenge i think it'd be an interesting experiment to just listen to it in a completely desensitized environment you know in the dark eyes closed and just actively mm-hmm. listening yeah so that's a challenge anybody who's listening go and try and be with tech witch in that way and i think i will try that because i did find myself struggling to concentrate when i was listening to it it's funny i do that that's actually after we get to the final take i'll do that and i realize that if i don't mm. have something else in front of me it's a lot easier for me to listen to it and there have been times where i before i'll go to bed or I'll listen to it just to see what, if I were someone else listening to this and I had nothing else around, what would it be? And I find I get really pulled into the story that way, even though I wrote it and I know the story, but when I remove all the other distractions around me, it it helps. It's a little bit of an experiment, Mm -hmm. but I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's good practice to be self-critical as well and to try and imagine yourself as a completely clean listener to it as well. That's brilliant. Yeah, I was going to ask you as well, because your studio, Prometheus Digital Studio, is that right? Um, the name. Mm-hmm. So now the title of that makes sense. Now that you've said about your <laughs> interest in mythology, um, Prometheus. And so your company, I mean, if I've understood correctly, you're using that company to try to really address what are gaps in representation across the board. And it's not just race and not just gender, but things like disability and you know social class and and all sorts of things it's how how do we work together to tackle these things across cultural production media production all these sorts of things you're so busy you've got all these different things going on (laughs) Um, is that something you'd like to flesh out for us as well maybe just the role of that company and your role in that company and the broader aims and how you're going about those so one of the answers obviously is through these podcasts but you know are there other things as well yeah so Prometheus is it's sort of the bread and butter that funds the podcast and we have some a lot of consulting clients we work with advertisers etc and a lot of the the conversation that we do there and a lot of the partnerships that we have are all targeted around diversity and i i know that a lot of people have this thing and they they say diversity and everyone has their own interpretation of it Mm -hmm. which is actually fun to talk to because what you'll find out is and we've done this exercise some people mean gender some people mean race Mm -hmm. some people mean race and gender some people mean everything Mm -hmm. and so there's lots of misunderstanding around it because everyone has defined it differently but assumes that we all have the same definition and what we really want to do with Prometheus is to help address that in a way that's authentic but not through the lens of you are so underrepresented or you are at a, you know you drew the short straw we want it to really be from the lens of let's remind ourselves of our common humanity I, I think we've become so accustomed to data and stats and numbers even more than we think I mean my company by definition is a data company and my goal in that though is to bring the humanity back into it because mm-hmm. so often we'll hear people talking about well 50 percent of people are and they're just a number or just a stat but they don't understand the humanity behind it and so the way that we interpret our data is we have that number but what does that mean mm-hmm. for actual people what are the people behind it? 
feeling? How are they interacting? What does that mean for daily lives? And that's really the, the lens through which we like to look at everything we do. And so instead of coming in and just giving you the number that, you know, like 30% of your audience is women, 30% of your audience is women who have this preference or live this lifestyle or are facing this challenge or whatever it is, mm-hmm. so that you can start to, to understand that these are people and not just numbers. Part of the way that we do that is even how we address the audience, we, we started to move away from demographics as being the, the focal point because demographics is usually just a shortcut to get to a behavior or a preference or something that you want to understand. When people say, oh yeah, we want to target men for this series or this blah, blah, blah. What they really want is they want people who exhibit these behaviors or who like these types of things or who these have this preference. And so we really try to get people to focus in on that because in doing that, what you see is you start to understand your audience or your consumer as a person and not as a thing or an object that you can move around, mm-hmm. right? And you, we start to see more respect towards the people that we're speaking to. And so I, I think that's always been a really big part of how I've looked at data, especially when it comes to audience and consumers. And I got tired of being told that that's not right. There's a shortcut to it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I started a company because I was tired of waiting for other people to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... I want to see change. I'm actually part of the problem if I don't actually make a a concerted effort to be the change that I'm asking for. So that's how Prometheus was born. We'd love you to be part of the conversation with AV Cultures Pod on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And we also have Discord. Just coming up on your point about people having different definitions of what, what do we mean by diversity? And I think there's, I think we're experiencing, certainly in the UK, we're experiencing quite a lot of pushback on the idea of wokeness. So if you're <laughs> promoting you know, any kind of, can we just have any other kind of human being do this thing? That's, you know, I mean, I love white men. They're great. A lot of them are lovely <laughs> people, but sometimes it's just, it's a bit boring, lads. You know, come on, can we have just anybody else <laughs> or changing? this thing but then you can get told off for being too woke about stuff and Mm -hmm. that's a bit of a problem and so it's there's so many tensions around trying to even the playing field for people but also trying not to alienate the people who feel like they're having something ripped away from them when actually Mm -hmm. if we even the playing field we all win we all do better everybody gets lifted up you know, I think a lot of people don't realize you know, men suffer because of the patriarchy as well. If we yep. sort out the patriarchy, we sort out everybody. For example, many other examples. Do you encounter any challenges, any pushback, any doubling down? You know, what are your experiences in trying to meet your aims? I do. And I I mean, I think part of the reason you you touched on it as well is that people feel threatened, right? Right now, everyone is making white men the big bad. Mm. And that's not fair, right? It's not like every white guy is out to get you or that's not the case. And I think the other thing is, so I'm part of this group called the Multicultural Insights Collective. And so we do research around how can you be more effective at diversity? And the first project that we're doing right now is called Words Matter. What is the language that we use so that we can make sure that we're talking about it in a way that's inclusive, but also that resonates across the board, right? That everyone kind of gets and we can align with versus a, a lot of the wokeness that we talk about. They'll take a word and it means one thing to someone else and it becomes pejorative to a different group. And so you immediately create tension. What I've discovered throughout that is a lot of even the most vocal critics of wokeness or diversity actually when you get down to it support it but what they're not supporting is the fact that they've been demonized Mm -hmm. right and so there's a there's a defense mechanism that's activated at that point right and there's there's also a fear of what are you taking away from Mm me um, versus the reality of well what do we all gain and we talked about my other podcast, Professional Confession, which is totally not scripted and it's, it's very serious. But the goal of that one, it was really, we did that because I realized that a lot of the conversations we had were people misunderstanding each other mm-hmm. or talking past each other. And then there's also the piece of people pontificating about things, but nothing ever really happening. And I, I didn't want that to happen. And people who had really genuine intentions were afraid because they didn't want to be labeled as woke or didn't want to make a mistake. And there's a certain shame around not knowing or asking the question. And I also wanted to figure out, is there a way that I could help mitigate that? And so we created a podcast where people could 
anonymously mm -hmm. share their experiences. So they don't, they don't have to have the shame. They can ask the question mm -hmm. and then I can bring on an expert because I'm not, there's no way I could be an expert mm -hmm. in all of these things. Right. But I, I, I could bring on an expert then who could speak to that mm -hmm. and give a solution for what's something that you can do today. You don't have to wait for your government or your job or whoever to fix it. You can just do today to help increase diversity and not lose your shirt on it. Right. And that I, I think has really been hugely helpful in, in communicating the fact that becoming more diverse and diversity is not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. It's not you give up something, I get something, which on both sides, I think you'll find a lot of people end up treating it that way that they want. Like I, I've heard people talking about feminism or Black Lives Matter as if I just want the right to be an oppressor myself. And I'm like, that's not mm -hmm. equality. That's not diversity. Mm -hmm. right? That's just basically putting someone new on top. And through the podcast, we've been able to speak to that, especially that notion of zero sum game and start to break that down and kind of include everyone and point out that we can't have true diversity, to be honest, unless white men are also part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. One of my guests, which was really, I think, probably one of my favorite, but also one of my more difficult episodes, we talked to an author, um, Andrew, and I, I'm, I forgot his last name, um, but he's, he's a white guy who wrote a book called White Men Go From Fragile to Agile. And I didn't realize until we had that conversation how uncomfortable it was for me to, to talk about this okay. with a, a white man, mm -hmm. right? It's not something that I had done before. And I realized in order for us to have that conversation, I had to be willing to be open mm -hmm. and receptive and listen. But I also had to be willing to be vulnerable in a sense to express areas where it would, for me, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I think in doing that and having that conversation, the thing that we both came away with was that we actually have to be brave enough to just have the conversation to begin yeah. with <laughs> and give each other room to make mistakes. So often I think the problem with wokeness is that we don't give people room to make mistakes. No one's going to be perfect. They're going to make mistakes. And um, I, I think that's where we get the pushback is that someone feels like if they try, mm. they're sort of damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. So why bother? Mm. And it feels that I've seen it mostly on Twitter where people's responses can be incendiary. You know, they're explosive and that doesn't help. Mm. Yeah. When somebody's genuinely going, oh, I've just heard about this. What's going on? And they want to learn. And I think people should be supported in learning. And I completely understand people's frustration with, well, it's not my job to educate you. You know, I'm exhausted as a woman. I've done that <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And I think, you know, I've, I've had experiences that may be, you know, at least cognate to what a black person may have experienced with oppression in certain circumstances. So it hasn't happened to me as a white person, but it, something similar has happened to me as a woman, for example, you know, or accentism, you know, I'm a Northern Irish mm -hmm. person in England, so I I get bother if I open my mouth, you know, um, <laughs> so it might be small, but I understand some things. And I think when you can appeal to someone's understanding as you're talking about, but it's having the environment that's safe enough to do that. And I think social media has not helped in a way and it had it could help it has the power I think to help because it has the power to create a lot of the problems in the first place <laughs> and I think you know in part it collides how far we have actually come and we haven't come far enough of course but we have come quite far and you're seeing big cultural institutions begin to acknowledge their colonial pasts and just be blunt about it because it, it's information I suppose coming back circle to data you know it's information mm -hmm. these things happened you know and if we don't say yes these things happened because we're not going to get anywhere if everybody just goes oh I'm so sorry here's some money to make up for <laughs> what your ancestors suffered you know it's not it's not yeah. really going to be helpful but if we go this happened I'm getting educated and let's try to do better for us and for future generation. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about it. I don't know what your feeling about it is. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I have recently come to the conclusion that, yes, we want our governments or our institutions or companies to, to have a bigger role. But until that happens, it's really important for us to embrace what we can control mm. and what we can influence. And if I'm able to work with or speak to or impact one person, two people, I've at least done what's within my power to do. Exactly. I may not be a big network, but the network that I do have, I can make an impact on. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we started taking that 
perspective more, it would really be helpful. Um, and understanding it, I go back to my mom and my grandmother mm. who, you know, suddenly now that I'm an adult seems so wise, right? <laughs> um, that my mom used to always say, and my grandmother, deal with people where they are, not where you want them to be. Oh, that's excellent. And it's it's something that's really hard, but I, I find myself having to remind myself mm. of that, that not everyone is where you think they should be, or not everyone has had the experience or the information that you do. So instead of trying to shun them for not being where you are understand them and deal with them where they are if they don't know that Mm -hmm. then it's okay to say you know I'm not in a place where I can educate you it's not my job but I'll tell you how I learned about your culture and maybe you can do the same right and leave it at that and it's a way to allow them to make that mistake it's it allowed them to make to ask that question but it also doesn't penalize them for having to ask the question and trying to learn yeah those are excellent points I think that's it because not everybody has the privilege of education so they might have privileges and they'll resent those things being called privileges because they don't feel very privileged and so as you say you know you have to meet them on on where they are at that moment you know what's going on in their lives they don't have the vocabulary that some of the rest of us might have because we are actively consuming knowledge on these things and trying to just reprogram the brain and that sort of thing because we all have our prejudices we all grow up with them and we all think of some other kind of person as the enemy and it's a lot Mm -hmm. of reconditioning and relearning things and unlearning things to wise up from that and go no they're not the (laughs) enemy they're just trying to muddle through life the same as we are you know so some really wonderful points there and I think you know, that's a really, really important one is the scale. Just be kind to yourself. And if you can just talk to one person and say to them, why did you, why did you do that? Are you homophobic? You know, mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. kind of gently talk to somebody who you care about. They know you, you're safe, they're safe and just have a chat about what was that all about? Why did you shout that at that person? Or, you know, Mm -hmm. what's going on there? Yeah. And just hear the story and then realize that a lot of the time it's something going on within themselves that they're angry about and not necessarily that that stranger exists over there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it's interesting because that's where I've, well, not recently, but I just over my life, I increasingly see the power of media in having that conversation as well, because a lot of times you may not have exposure to said group, right? That you don't understand them. So you don't have anyone to refer back to or even to talk to. And I remember I I was living in, well, when I lived in Spain, it happened a little bit. But when I was in South America, when I lived in Chile, that was particularly poignant where I have a friend and I, we were going on a subway and we were going to meet some friends of his. And this gentleman sat across from us and he heard us speaking, right? I mean, everyone, we were in Chile, we're all speaking Spanish, but our accents weren't Mm -hmm. Chilean. Mm -hmm. Um, So my friend is from Puerto Rico and I'm um, from LA, but both of us have very Caribbean accents. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped us and he asked, you know, where are you guys from? And so my friend said Puerto Rico and I told him Los Angeles. And he said, there's no way you could be from Los Angeles. Are you from Brazil? And I'm like, no, I'm from Los Angeles. (laughs) He's all, no, you're not white. So where are you from really? Like, where's your family from? And I told him my parents were also born in Los Angeles and my grandparents, well, at least one of my grandparents was, but they're all just from Mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And he kept saying, no, but that can't be right. Mm. And he stayed on the subway. He passed his stop, stayed on the subway, wow. just grilling us. And then we got off the subway and we're walking to go catch a bus. And he followed us and mm. was asking, no, you, you can't. I've never seen a black person from Los Angeles. They're surfers and they're, and he had all of these things. You're not a basketball player. Are you a rapper then? I would no, I'm not. I'm actually here at business school, but um, no, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles. He's like, you must be Danish. I've seen Danish people on TV who are black. So you must be. And he just kept going through everywhere. He'd seen black people that could be from. Are you African? Are you Jamaican? And no, I'm not. And all of his references were from what he had seen in media. Mm-hmm. And I realized that several times I, I've had that sort of experience where people equate to what they've seen on television or what they've heard on the radio or what they've seen on social media, and they assume that this must be the world. And so I started doing some research on just media in general and from its inception, radio, TV, even newspaper. Um, the media industry has been very self-aware of the influence it could have over diversity and how people perceive each other and very pointedly has chosen either not to or to do it in a way that's divisive but gets the industry more money. Mm. There are riveting studies from even just the 30s and the 40s of, around media. Um, and in doing that, I realized that, well, 
a lot of people think it's just art. It's just, you know, entertainment. Mm. But it actually, it, it does more than that because it does create a cultural and societal reference point for people. Yeah, it, I think that's important. And it allows us to have some of these conversations without actually mm-hmm. having them sometimes. That's so interesting. That's just reminded me that because, that, you know, I grew up in a, an incredibly white place and it was during the conflict in Northern Ireland as well. So there was very little migration actually coming in. Well, any that there was in the 90s, Hong Kong was still still belonged to Britain (laughs) so we had a lot of people from Hong Kong but other than that you didn't really see very often unless it was a soldier or something you didn't really see but you did sometimes but very very rarely Mm -hmm. um so I was very naive and and I probably had a lot of those beliefs uh, similar to that man I don't think I'd have stalked somebody to make the point (laughs) but (laughs) but yeah I just remember one of my favorite films when I was a teenager was Empire Records and it's set in San Francisco and then I grew up And I read loads of stuff and I watch loads of things. I read loads of things that are set in San Francisco and it's queer capital. There's loads of different kinds of communities. There's lots of Latin people. There's loads of African-Americans there. And then you go back to this film and you go, where's all the gay and not white people? (laughs) It's just (laughs) all white kids, heteronormative quite rich Mm -hmm. and you think gosh and this was the 90s you know this is it wasn't (laughs) like you know the 50s or anything I mean and and there's (laughs) there's films from the 50s where you've got more African-American characters and yes they're in menial roles but they're there (laughs) you know (laughs) know what I mean and it's it's Mm -hmm. quite a shock and that film meant so much to me as a as a teenager and then learning about the erasure that was going on in, in movies like that and allowing kids like me elsewhere in the world to grow up believing that San Francisco was just full of white people that is a real problem and it is then quite a shock when you do learn about those things and not everybody (laughs) does learn those things I you know I did a film degree so you know I I started to learn about those things but most people you know generally aren't going to so that's so interesting that example but that sounds actually quite scary (laughs) (laughs) And I think that's where the idea of, for me at least, starting to realize that there are certain privileges that I have, right? Mm. It's heteronormative male going someplace with a friend, some guy following us, Mm. not that much of a threat. There are two of us in one of you. And so physically, we don't have the fear of him attacking us, Mm. right? Um, And if he did, there's still two of us and just one of him. Mm. And so there's something different there. I mean, it was night and we're in another country and that, I, that idea never crossed my mind, right? I just thought he was like a fly being annoying. And I, I you know, can you go away? We're going to go visit some friends now. And even in so the last episode of Professional Confession, I, I spoke about that a little bit where I realized I had actually been sort of on the receiving end of discrimination mm-hmm. and it completely threw me for a loop because it came from a woman. Mm-hmm. It came from a Jewish woman mm-hmm. and it's not a place where I expected to see it. And it's not a role that I realized I found myself in mm-hmm. often. The thought is that, you know, well, I'm, a black male. So of course that was going to be the, the area where I would get discrimination, but usually the male isn't the part of it where the discrimination comes from. It was the black. And so this time it wasn't the black, it was the male yes. that was the discrimination. Yeah. It was not something that I had been familiar with. And then it suddenly made me realize that I had to have some level of privilege in that because I've never had that experience. I'm used to, I can be assertive and no one questions it, right? Yeah. I can do something and it's never been a, I've never had anyone talk about how, you know, at work at least, men are useless or like we can't really trust them and stuff. And having that experience was it was really, I think, useful in making me even more empathetic, but also realizing that I can't claim victimhood all the time. Right? There, Even in being a Black male, I still have privilege yeah. um, because I'm male. There are rooms and conversations that I'm brought into that women don't get pulled into. Mm. And so coming to that conclusion was actually, it was kind of a, of a challenge mm. um, to be frank that I couldn't say that like, oh, no, 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 no. But I'm always a victim. The, the idea of intersectionality and mm. the fact that there are multiple societal factors at play mm. really did stand out. And so I, in that, even in creating Tech Witch and Muses and the series that we're creating, I want to make sure then that I'm not being so full of hubris and the notion that I can tell every story mm. and really allow someone else to 
tell their own story, right? Mm-hmm. Because it, my perspective on it is my perspective, but it may not be accurate and do more harm than good. But I really valued that. I listened to that episode of Professional Confessions and I really valued you being so open because I don't think that's an easy thing for a man to talk about, actually, because it's something I have encountered. I um, have a former life as an academic and that kind of bullying is quite rife. In a lot of institutions, the worst bullies I've had have been women. And it's the sort of people who, not in a malicious way, I don't think they even realize they're doing it a lot of the time, but they Mm -hmm. pull the ladder up after them because they think, well, I I can't get this taken away from me now and I can't help anybody else up because then they'll be better than me. And, you know, so it's that idea Mm -hmm. of thread again. But I really valued you talking about that because I witnessed that happening to male colleagues by the same senior women colleagues who who were bullying me. They were bullying men who were my peers as well. I think unless we talk about these things in an open way and it is difficult and it's difficult for some people to hear as well and it's you know I find it really difficult because you know sort of with feminism you're not supposed to be negative about (laughs) women but actually there's a lot of women out there who are not feminists even if they think they are Mm -hmm. you know intersectionality again that it's what flavor is your feminism and unfortunately I mean I can't speak to the individual that you're talking about I don't know what their context is but I, I have encountered women who think that the way to even things out is to do to men today what men have historically been doing to women all this mm-hmm. time and that'll somehow balance it out but it was like you mentioned earlier you just become a carbon copy of the oppressor you, you know you just move who is oppressed and who's the oppressor and that's not helping anyone I really valued you going through your own story and being really open about that I think that's really brave and important and hopefully will encourage other people to do the same thank you no that that means a lot because honestly i i spoke to my pr team and even everyone i knew i was really nervous about releasing that episode it's a really personal experience firstly and i also didn't want it to come across as me being negative towards women and feminism because that wasn't the intent Mm -hmm. it was really for me to highlight that it, it helped make me more empathetic and i realized that in that situation there are times where i have privilege but i also realized that Not everyone is immune from biases Mm -hmm. and and prejudices. So I really wanted to communicate that. And I was was really glad to get a positive response from it because I was so nervous. I was like, okay, I'm going to hit send, publish now. Um, (laughs) But it it, it turned out well. So I'm I'm glad I actually did it. I I figured it was something that could hopefully help someone else. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I definitely got a lot out of listening to it because I recognized so much of what you were talking about. I mean, whether they ever hear it or not, but I know of individual men that I'm friends with who would benefit from listening to it. So I'm going to pass it on, you know, just in case it can, even if it's just you're not alone, mate, you know, this is happening to other people. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. The, I, I think it's it's important. I mean, so much of the, the work is sadly just starting the conversation yeah. until it's been brought to light no one no one knows and I think the one good thing that happened with the pandemic and then the upswell of Black Lives Matter which had been around for a while mm-hmm. was that people were suddenly people felt empowered to verbalize mm-hmm. and to express things that had been sort of latent under the surface for so long mm-hmm. and they felt that there was this need to just suffer in silence and deal with it because that's just the way of the world and then once people started expressing and sharing it they realized that it wasn't just the way of the world and there were other people sitting and suffering in silence as well maybe with a slightly different circumstance but they were also doing it and so it brings it back to highlighting the fact that there there are differences yes we're unique but at the end of the day that the commonality of those human experiences we have Mm -hmm. really outnumber those those differences that we've been focusing on yeah for sure uh well Damien I'm wary of keeping you much longer. We've been talking for an hour (laughs) and um, you've been so wonderful. Can you point people towards where to find out more about you, website, socials, that sort of thing? Yes, definitely. Um, So you can go to prometheusdigitalstudio.com and we have a drop down in the menu for content. So you can hear both of our podcasts that are active right now, Digital Compendium podcast that's our our brand but you'll see tech witch and professional confession those are the two we're working on and then we'll be adding to that Um, or you can find us on instagram and facebook at digital underscore compendium 
or Prometheus Digital. Either one is great. And feel free to reach out, send us messages. We, we reply, love to have conversations with people. I think it really helps keep us grounded and we don't get too full of ourselves. And plus, it's just fun to learn from other people. Yeah. So, Well, I really hope we can keep in touch. I have just feel, I feel really enriched speaking to you and I've really enjoyed your company. I'd love to hear more about your life in Chile. I'm a little bit obsessed with Chile. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go there someday. <laughs> we should. It, it was fun. It was really, really great. Yeah. Um, we should definitely do something about that. And I, I was actually working in media there and I ended up somehow on a news talk show oh. when I went there. We were, we were touring a, a, a TV station and they ended up pulling me and my classmates on air and it, it was really funny um but yeah it, there's definitely a lot of fun things there and media in Chile is, is an interesting thing mm-hmm. yes oh thanks so much Jamie and it's been just an absolute pleasure thank you so much for everything you're doing thank you so much for having me Paula I really appreciate it this was a great conversation hopefully we can we can chat again soon I'd love that you're welcome back anytime when you get your other podcasts fired up Let's have a big chat about those. (laughs) Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. (laughs) 